thanks so much for joining us, both uh, of you. Our, our pleasure. pleasure. So one thing I want to ask about the One World Trade Center project, since it's taken such a long time for so many reasons, and it's such a large project, I just wonder if now that we're nearing the completion of it, or of large parts of it, um, if now you would look back and do anything different, if you hadn't been, um, if you had the benefit of this time. Um, I've heard it be said by several people, planners and experts in these things, we wouldn't have placed the tower on top of a rail, an operating railroad track. That would be, if that was my choice, we would have placed at the center of the site, uh, what's called the east bathtub, and center it over terra firma, not over a set of tracks, which was a large part of um, the work that had to be done to get the foundations in there. Um, we said that they were working with spoons. They literally were out there with shovels and wow. boxes right. and uh, doing handwork to do the excavation. Hmm. I'll start from the end. If the, we have the opportunity, if we had the opportunity to go back and change anything, it would be the circumstances under which we all started this journey, I would say. Um, over the years, we all became like a family, very good friends. And um, I think the collaboration spirit in this job was something you know, un, unseen before mm. and something we always look back and reflect on. Um, technically, it was challenging. You know, it's hard to reflect on something that since then we made so many advancements, technically and knowledge-based. So obviously we know today more. We would have done a few things differently, but we wouldn't change a whole lot. I think we've made a big step um, through this end of war together, uh, and we really reached a um, very high level of technical skills here. Hmm. I wonder if, because of the circumstances of the site, there were so many security concerns that the, the base of the building in particular has often been compared to you know, sort of a fortress feel. And I wonder if you have any thoughts about how to respond to security needs uh, in high-rise buildings and tall buildings and still make them feel um, elegant or a part of their context? I, if you haven't been there, I would urge you to go there and walk in the lobby. It doesn't feel like a fortress. It doesn't feel like this bunker that people... And we, as a team, had the opportunity to learn some things and work with some of the best minds in the security uh, industry to talk about how do you do a tall building and how do you make it feel... Um, and not just feel, but be a traditional Class A office building. Because we knew at the very beginning, if this was a bunker or had levels of security you find in a courthouse, there was going to be no tenant that would want to be in that building. That, that from the moment they walked in, they would be, their sensibilities would be heightened. They would be thinking about these things. And in fact, through technology um, on our side, engineering uh, logic about creating a, defensive spa a defensible space, that you could create a building that, uh, in fact, exceeded expectations in that way. And we did that at Seven World Trade Center. Mm -hmm. Through the use of the cable net wall that you see in Tower One, we learned a lot about the characteristics of those types of walls. We learned about where that security was moving forward in terms of um, facial recognition mm -hmm. and cameras. And we also learned uh, about creating a flexible place that should things get heightened, should their concerns be there, that, that has the infrastructure to um, provide a level, an additional level of protection if that's required, i.e. magnetometers, scanning, and the like. We even have um, put in armature uh, within the building for future technologies, sniffers, things like that that are... Sniffers? Sniffers mm -hmm. that can sniff chemicals mm -hmm. um, and that are sensitive. Right now, by a lot, we're the canary in the coal mine, so to speak, uh, biological filters and those things, but that's coming. That technology will come and will be part of the systems in the building. What would that look like, bio biological filters? Probably a filter that um, uh, it's biological in nature and its characteristic, probably its chemical characteristic changes when it has a certain types of reaction. Hmm. Um, remember, when we were in the midst of designing seven, um, the anthrax, hmm. um, it wasn't just a scare, it was actual attack at NBC and other places. And that was not part of 9-11, but that was sort of a part of, uh, we had to think about those things in a way we didn't necessarily think about them in traditional ways. And it's not something you gather you get taught in architecture school, right? You don't get taught that anywhere except maybe in the military. Mm -hmm. That's the type of thing you think about. But that's interesting. I mean, responding to new threats all the time, it's kind of responding to new conditions all the time mm -hmm. and, and site restrictions or clients' demands. I mean, architects, that, that kind of is the job, is to always respond to, to new circumstances. 
or any of the circumstances. It's a problem that's put before you. Um, the iconic nature of this building was a problem. Um, how do you respond to such a horrific event, such an, a national and international event? Um, you know, David talks about that we had to be quiet about it. Not quiet, don't speak to it, but speak to it in a soft way so that people would recognize the form is related to the place, is related to the time, but in many ways is aspirational and looks forward, as all of our great monuments and iconic buildings do. Yeah, could you expand on that? How does the, the form respond to the site of the history? Well, the, there's some simple things. Uh, the height of the building was set by uh, mm -hmm. the master plan at 1776. Mm -hmm. There are numerous, um, numerous m through a series of memory elements, but most importantly, the form of the building is simple. And simple um, in a way that when a child walks away and looks at the building and sees the building as this tower icon, that you can draw it in a sketch. You know, the great monuments of the world, those iconic buildings, we can all quickly do a hand sketch, whether we're architects or not, and they resonate with us uh, when we leave. Mm. I don't think anybody can draw, even though it's a, an icon for America, the capital, you'll probably get the domes wrong, and what's high, what's <laughs> low. But when you look at the, um, the Trade Center, you, know, you look at One World Trade Center, you, you, it's pretty clear what the form is. Mm -hmm. The memory elements are the height of the building is, uh, of the uh, body of the building is 1,368 feet high, which was the taller of the two towers. It's also, the, there's a parapet line that marks where the stainless steel of the parapet stops that marks 1,362 feet. That's the south tower. Mm. The form of the building is the same size, approximately 200 by 200 as the footprints of the old Trade Center Tower. And as you look at it, as you, it rotates around, there's a moment when it becomes the figure of the old World Trade Center. Hmm. It's the same form of it, if not the physical being of it. Mm -hmm. um, other characteristic is at the corners. Um, I'm from Philadelphia, and uh, you drive back to New York at the end of your weekend visiting family or such. And as sun was setting, the corners of the Trade Center would light up. And there's, there's lots of documentation. They just, and the reason for that was that, as you know, New York is an orthogonal grid, pretty straightforward. But the corners of the Trade Centers were 45 degrees to that. So they would pick up the western light different than the rest of the buildings, and they would shine. Mm. So we found a stainless steel, this beautiful, um, um, it, it's called laser etch, but it's an embossed stainless steel that picks up the warm color and reflects. What we didn't anticipate was that the isosceles triangles would actually pick up the light even greater. Um, and there's some phenomenal pictures of this building, just one angle of the building shining um, as the sun sets or as the sun rises in the city. Has that unexpected glare caused any problems? Um, no, because it's um, facing skyward. Mm -hmm. the, the usual things that happen in New York early in the morning happen. You mm -hmm. know, sometimes you turn a corner and it's a little bit bright, but it's, mm -hmm. it's not uh, because those particular corners are uh, canted. It's not something that uh, jumps out at you that, that I've seen or, and nor have I heard complaints about. I must add about the massing of the building is very uh, engineer friendly, if you will. Um, the fact that it tapers, tapers in really um, helps a lot with bypassing the wind loads and uh, not resisting them, and, and um, its aeronautics uh, is, is uh, very significant, so it helps. We call it confusing the wind, so there that the go. shape at the top and the shape at the bottom are different, the responses to the building. Mm -hmm. um, the other elements, when you walk into the lobby, it's uh, the same height as the old Trade Center, which was white Carrera marble, which we've reintroduced, um, a sort of monumental stone, obviously by its character, but then etched in its surface this, the, the lines of the module of the building, a five-foot module that reads throughout the lobby. Mm -hmm. You can stand at a corner of, uh, in the lobby and see this core, this massive core coming down into the lobby. There's sort of these moments, these heroic moments. Um, and the, um, the glass itself has this notion of reflectivity. We're using a, a, a ultra-low iron glass, and it's in a way contrary to and in reaction to the old Trade Center, which had very narrow windows, which is to maximize the daylight into the space and reduce the spans. It mm. sort of talks to the past as we talk to the future. Mm. So how does the structure reinforce the security of the building? So the structure uh, is the intent in the structural design and the layout of the framing members is to follow normal conventional construction. Uh, we were able to, to extract from this conventional framing much more in terms of security. Um, this is by simply using enhanced tools 
and thinking outside the box. Um, the security measurements on this building are unprecedented uh, compared with any other office building that has been that had been constructed in New York or anywhere else before. And uh, we basically try to take this conventional approach and still address the security issues that were paramount to the design. I did want to add one thing. Oh, go ahead. Um, so uh, um, the deepest honor has been placed upon us and responsibility to work on a project of such magnitude, not just a, a super tall building, but a building that um, sits as close as it does and within the grounds of, the, of, the, of ground zero. And uh, we lost a colleague on that day. And we, um, as a firm, dedicated ourselves to responding in the, any way we saw possible. Little did we know that we would have this opportunity. And it's been, I think, for all of us, one of the greatest opportunities of our careers. What was the colleague's name? Uh, Arkady Zaltzman, who had come to the United States from uh, Eastern Europe. The only place he wanted to work was Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. And just by fortune, that day, he got a call from a client asking him to come over and punch list something uh, at Aon up in the tower. Mm -hmm. He called his colleagues um, and spoke to them before, he, uh, before the collapse. And this project then, personally, for you and for the firm, is a tribute Very much. to him. A tribute to him and all the people that lost their lives that day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.